Hello, my name is Tony. This one's a bit of an oddity. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oddities can be good. Space oddity, that was good. And Bill Oddy, he was in the goodies, so he must have been good. Otherwise, they'd have called it the baddies. Uh, hold on. No, this is shit. Scrap that. Let's start again. In the early 70s, disaster movies were popular. We had planes in peril crashing out of the sky, ocean liners turning upside down, skyscrapers on fire, earthquakes, love story. The idea was a simple one. Think of a disaster scenario. Base, thousands of them. Fill it with a cast of characters involved with the disaster in various ways. Give some of them a bit of a background and history and kill some of them off and have some of them survive. A hero, some love interest, a despicable self-serving villain or two. Bob's your uncle, Frida's your aunt and Cecily is your mad cousin in the attic. You've got box office. Riding this wave in 1974, did I just say that? Was Juggernaut and it wasn't as the title might might suggest about a runaway articulated lorry on a collision course with a school full of deaf kids. See, they wouldn't hear it coming, hence the suspense. No, it's about a bloody big ocean liner chock full of bombs and held to ransom by some wacko who uses the codename Juggernaut. But more about that later. First though, it's a bit of an oddity. Because... Although it shares many similarities with the disaster movie template, it's not really a disaster movie. It's more a film that seeks, by default or design, to hitch a ride on the coattails of the trend. Ultimately, it's a straightforward suspense-driven thriller with a few smart touches and minor twists that set it apart. Huge ocean liner SS Britannic leaves port amidst much fanfare. Masses of ticker tape, brass band, Anthony Hopkins as Scotland Yard Superintendent John McLeod waving farewell to his wife, played by Caroline Mortimer, and two irritating kids. There's a brisk whip round of some of the passengers and crew. Captain Brunel, Omar Sharif, Entertainment Officer Curtin, Roy Kinnear, Barbara Bannister, Shirley Knight, a mature but undeniably cute American lady travelling alone, American politician Corrigan, Clifton James, yeah, J.W. Pepper himself, a gaggle of nuns, gotta have nuns, and sundry other odds and sods. Immediately there are problems. The weather is howlingly wild, blowing a serious gale. The sea is dangerously rough and the ship's gyros are defective. So there is much roiling and rolling and seasickness going on. Icing on this cake is thus. Owner of the shipping line Porter, Ian Holm, receives a phone call from a man calling himself Juggernaut. Juggernaut alleges he has planted seven drums of high explosives on board. Time to detonate at dawn, send in the Britannic and 1,200 passengers and crew to the bottom of the sea. He's generously offering information on how to defuse the bombs for a price. If he doesn't receive a ransom of £500,000, everyone is fucked. As a demonstration, several smaller charges go off, wounding a few crew members, but causing negligible damage to the vessel. As evacuating in the lifeboats would be suicidal in the adverse weather, Porter wants to pay the ransom. But shady government official, are there any other sort, Hughes, John Stride, strongly advises against, as it's not government policy to cut deals with terrorists. And Porter's company receives a large government subsidy. No influence or pressure intended, of course. Instead, Superintendent McLeod is charged with identifying and tracking down Juggernaut. And naval bomb disposal expert Fallon, Richard Harris, with his second-in-command Braddock, David Hemmings and their team are to be parachuted into the sea near the liner, hop on board and defuse the bombs. That achieved, everyone gets to go home happy, except for Juggernaut, who will get a new life as a prison inmate at Her Majesty's pleasure until he turns up his toes and dies. If you're getting an inkling that things might not prove to be quite so simple, you'd be on the right track. Producer David V. Picker resigned as head of production for United Artists, formed his own film company, Two Roads, and had a slate of 13 projects lined up which United Artists were going to distribute. The first was Lenny, a biopic about the life of seminal US comedian Lenny Bruce and starring Dustin Hoffman in the title role. Juggernaut was the second. It was to be shot in Britain, mostly filmed on location in the North Sea on a chartered liner owned by a Russian shipping company. Brian Forbes was set to direct, but for some reason, and dropped out. As Forbes was a remarkably mediocre director at best, this was probably no great loss. His replacement, Don Taylor, also jumped ship. See what I did there? Jump ship? Please yourself. With time running out on the rental agreement for the tub, Picker turned to his old friend Richard Lester. 
Lester had just wrapped the three and four musketeers flicks and went straight into working on Juggernaut. It was to be a ten week shoot, but Lester got it done in six. He also rewrote the script with Alan Plater, but the original author and producer Richard Allen Simmons so disliked the reworking he had himself credited as Richard D. Coker on the final print. Lester remained adamant that Juggernaut was not a disaster movie, but it was certainly marketed as one and it arguably includes many of the same tropes. There are, however, elements of content and style that set it apart. Lester goes for a semi-documentary look and feel. There is no bright technical high saturation here, it's all very grey and downcast, with a muted visual realism prevalent throughout. His signature use of overlapping dialogue and muttered asides of a comically sardonic nature are present and correct. Humour, tinged with a hint of bitterness and pathos, is provided by Roy Kinnear's hapless entertainments officer, most notably at the fancy dress gala night, wherein he strenuously tries to channel merriment and engage with an audience preoccupied with the thought that they might well be headed to a watery grave in the morning. Talk about a tough crowd. He's like a very bad court jester in a castle under siege and burning down around him, trapped in the futile belief that the show must go on and the mood must lighten. In the end, quite reasonably, he despairs and gives up. Now's the time to roll the barrel all together cause the gang all here! Kinnear also references the Titanic to grim comedic effect. Of the gala fancy dress ball, he quips, Everything all right, Mr. Curtin? Oh, a night to remember. Can you... A Night to Remember was the 1958 Kenneth Moore movie about the sinking of the ship. And when Shirley Knight asks him for something positive... In your professional capacity, you're supposed to be cheering us up. There aren't any icebergs. The twin central threads of the narrative are Hopkins' investigation to find and apprehend Juggernaut and Harris's mission to defuse the bombs. Harris falls back on his stock roguish Irish charmer act as a steel-nerved hard-drinking specialist with a penchant for blarney and bravado. It's the sort of thing he could smoothly and effortlessly roll out as a matter of course. The sort of thing that reminds why he was so good as a leading man amongst men engaged in manly endeavours in movies like this. David Hemmings provides decent support for as long as he lasts before one teeny slip sees him blown to bejesus. And Anthony Hopkins comes over a bit low-key, slightly disengaged, as if he'd rather be somewhere else doing something else. Not one of his most committed performances, this. For a man who has a wife and kids on a liner that's about to be scuttled, McLeod seems somewhat emotionally detached. Maybe he just didn't fucking like him, or had them heavily insured. Omar Sharif does his agent Lothario bit, his character involved in an affair with Shirley Knight, but otherwise his captain doesn't have a great deal to do in the scheme of things. Give orders, argue with Harris, wear a uniform, smolder and stare intensely. It comes over very old fashioned these days, the technology for tackling the bombs like something from the Stone Age. But Lester knows how to crank up the tension, and the strategy of Fallon assigning his team to a device each whilst he takes the lead is a cool way of supporting this. The idea is that Fallon makes the first move, and if he doesn't get turned into rapidly evaporating chunks of human mincemeat up the walls, his subordinates replicate it exactly. If he does, then the next man in line takes the lead, avoiding the last move he made that got him killed, and so on. This is a risky proposition because it assumes each device is set up the same. Plus, if only two more bombs go off, the ship will sink regardless. Groovy, yeah? Hopkins and his men trace and apprehend Juggernaut, who turns out to be one Sidney Buckland, played by Freddie Jones. Buckland is an ex-bomb disposal jockey who was unceremoniously retired from the service on a lousy birdseed pension and is out for some payback. He was also Fallon's friend, colleague and mentor. What it comes down to in the end is... Should Fallon cut the blue wire or the red wire in the final stage of rendering the devices safe? Under arrest and in radio contact with Fallon, Buckland tells him to cut the blue wire. But is he telling the truth? What do you reckon? Blue? Red? More importantly in my young head was, how did an alien old duffer like Buckland get seven steel drums full of timed explosives, as well as the devices for his demonstration pyrotechnics, onto the Britannic in the first place? But I guess that's a question the film doesn't really invite or want you to ask. There are some mutterings about lax security, which is as close to an answer as you're going to get.
Putting that to one side, Juggernaut is a fine, down-to-earth little disaster movie-flavoured thriller. It's occasionally thoughtful, often amusing, and generally suspenseful. Filmed in real bad weather and in turbulent seas on a real ocean liner, it looks and feels authentic. When Fallon and his team parachute out of the drop plane and into the ocean, their struggle to board the Britannic feels genuinely fraught with danger. The bomb-diffusing scenes are nerve-wracking and attention-focusing. It's not a major work of thriller genre genius, but it doesn't leave its open to outright mockery like the airport franchise. Reference Airplane 1980. There is humour, but it's compatible with the film's docudrama vibe, and it succeeds in striking as a more serious-minded and halfway intelligent endeavour with a human edge. I liked it well enough on release, and I still give it a spin now and then. It's never boring or outright stupid, and these days that's got to count for something, right? Moonfall is a disaster movie in every conceivable sense of the term. It was released this year. If you ever see it, and I hope for the sake of your sanity you never do, it will make Juggernaut seem like a gift from the gods. Thanks for your time and attention. Usual drill if you want to, like, don't like, comment, subscribe. But no pressure either way. Not like I can control what anyone does anyway, is it? Two reviews in a row now that deal with explosives. I'm not going to start a trend with this, so the next one will be something different. What could it be, one wonders? Wait and see, pilgrims.